This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. How can you overcome the problems and defeats which you suffer in the living of your life? First, realize simply that it can be done. The famous statesman Benjamin Franklin had only two years of formal schooling, and during both of those years he failed at mathematics and could not comprehend Latin. But did he give up? Not in the least. And by the end of his life he had mastered French, Spanish, and Italian, was a leading scientist of his day, and the foremost statesman in the entire world. He decided to educate himself, to keep his mind alive, to overcome defeat with victory, and so, if you will, can you by living faith in the living God. Rather than feeling defeated by problems and challenges, be stimulated by them and permit the Spirit of God indwelling your mind to transform your thinking processes. Back in the early 1960s, the U.S. Peace Corps organization put out an unusual poster which read, Trichnosis, Encephalitis, Snail Fever, Jungle Rot. We think you'll find them more challenging than the sniffles. Take up the challenge. And did that sort of advertising pay off for the Peace Corps? It most certainly did. This tough-talking campaign, coupled with intensified recruiting on college campuses, nearly doubled Peace Corps applications in a period of just two years. In another advertisement, they said, Your starting pay in the Peace Corps is 11 cents an hour. At the end of two years of service, you'll still be making 11 cents an hour. End of quote. Human life is never easy. And aspiring to live a great life is a guarantee of difficulties. But 2,000 years ago, there lived a man, a charismatic carpenter, who taught how to live through tough times on a hard planet. Jesus told his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. Because the power needed to live valiantly through problematic situations is the very power of God. Nothing less will do. And it is by your faith in God you will discover and unleash the untapped potentials dormant within your life. The kingdom of God, said Jesus, is within you. And you are a son or a daughter of God, infinitely valuable and infinitely beloved. Real religion is the authentic key to real happiness in life because religion fosters joy, authentic happiness. It means the positive approach to life. It sounds the triumphant note. It does not live in sniveling defeat, but in victory. Victory of spirit doesn't mean happiness that avoids all trouble, runs around it, folds up when trouble hits it or when it encounters trouble. Real religion is precisely the power in life to find happiness in the midst of trouble, through it, in spite of it. Other ways to happiness, thoughtless, immature ways, sheltered ways, the ways of the Pharisees and the publicans that walk by on the other side of troubles or problems, all of these ways to happiness ultimately crumble. They die, they fold up, they simply cannot sustain themselves when trouble strikes. Only the truly religious way to happiness can keep a steady song singing in life right through trouble, problems, difficulties of whatever nature. One of the greatest mistakes any person can make in his or her philosophy of life is to assume that trouble comes along as some sort of an interruption to the normal course of daily life. Trouble is not an interruption to the normal course of daily life. Trouble is the normal course of daily life. It's true. And if you make the mistake of beginning with the assumption that life ought to be absolutely untroubled, that the ideal life is the unproblematic life, you will not know what to do with trouble and problems when they come. Every disaster you will look upon as an intruder to be resented. And because you begin with a false picture of life, you will soon discover that life cannot be lived upon that basis at all because you have that false picture. Because disasters will come in upon you someday as they come in upon all of us. Hardships will arrive. Adversity will climb your stoutest garden wall. Your ideals for an untroubled life will fall to pieces in disillusionment because you began wrong with a wrong picture of life, a wrong understanding of it, and therefore it will end badly for you. Begin by assuming that life 
is essentially difficult and that it's going to be hard, that it is going to be tough, that its fabric has many dark threads running through it. Now, is this a pessimistic, gloomy view of life? Not in the least. Not pessimistic, not gloomy, but the only basis, in fact, for lasting happiness. Suppose, by contrast, that you began with the ideal of pleasure only. That were your concept of human existence. No disaster, no trouble, no difficulty, only pleasantness and peace. That that's what life is supposed to be, that's what it's going to be. Are you getting ready to be happy on that basis? Quite to the contrary, you're preparing yourself quite definitely to be quite miserable. Because you do not understand, with that sort of concept, the real nature of life, wrote Paul. The whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And that is the truth. But Paul could also write, rejoice in God always, and again I say rejoice. That is the power of faith. That is the transition, the transformation, which faith in God can make in your life. You read in the life of Jesus, on one occasion, he came into his own native town, followed by his disciples. And when the Sabbath day came, he began to teach in the synagogue. The congregation, however, was astonished. And people began to remark, where does he get all this? That was their reaction. Where does he get all this that he's saying? What is this wisdom that he has been given? And what about these marvelous things that he's supposedly going around doing? He was healing, raising the dead. They said, he's only the carpenter. He's Mary's son. He's the brother of James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and his sisters are living here with us. In other words, he's just a hometown boy. Why does he come in and propose to teach us these amazing things? And they were deeply offended with him, J.B. Phillips' translation reads. But Jesus said to them, no prophet goes unhonored except in his own country or with his own relations or in his own home. You wonder how many... A potentially great religious leader has been ridiculed to silence and doubting by his own family, hometown, or friends. Don't let anybody taunt you or talk you out of following God's will for your life. For there's a fragment of infinity, something of God's very presence, resident within your mind to instruct you, to guide you, to lead you, to inspire and stimulate your thinking. Seek above all things the will of God, praying, it is my will that yours be done. This will give you a new sense of momentum, of motivation, of meaning in the living of your life. I remember one time I talked with a young woman at the University of California who said that her religion very simply consisted of this, affirming the meaningfulness of life every morning when she awoke. She said, if I didn't believe that life had a meaning, I could not go on day after day. Does your life have a meaning? Not merely a small little artificial self-manufactured meaning, but a great and mighty purpose above yourself and beyond yourself. God has such a purpose for your life. It is the will of God, and you can and will find it if you will seek it, but you must seek, said the master, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and you will receive. Years ago, when the work of the old League of Nations was beginning to seem futile, the League of Nations preceded the United Nations organization. But when the League of Nations was beginning to fail, Henry Sloan Coffin asked the aged William Howard Taft, who had been long enthusiastic about the success and the potential of the League of Nations, what do you think about the League now? And Taft answered, you ought to know that in our world, the best things always get crucified, but, said Taft, they always rise again. And wrote William Jennings Bryan, never be afraid to stand with the minority when the minority is right. For the minority, which is right, will one day be the majority. Always be afraid to stand with the majority, which is wrong. For the majority, which is wrong, will one day become the minority. Do not be swayed by the vagaries of popular opinion. Seek above all things the will of God and the wisdom of God and the way of God for the living of your life. For a mighty ship 
a sail upon the sea is not navigated by taking a vote of the crew, but by taking a reading of the stars. Seneca said, there is nothing which persevering effort and unceasing and diligent care cannot overcome. And Ovid wrote, endure and persist, and every pain will turn to your good. This is vital living. This is valiant living. Living as you were born and created to live courageously. As the son or daughter of God, you really are. You are of royal lineage. You are kin to the creator. Martin Luther was threatened, excommunicated, ridiculed, misrepresented, and stood in danger of sudden death from his religious enemies. Yet he persisted, and he said, Here I stand, I can do no other. John Wesley was driven from his congregation to preach in the streets where mobs threw stones at him. People spat in his face, and yet there he stood, preaching on. Your spiritual forefathers were often whipped through the streets. They hid in the hills from enemies who wanted to kill them. Men and women were burned to death for daring to put the Bible into print in a language which people could read and understand. Men and women for centuries have had to stand fast in courage for their faith, for what they believed. Will you have that courage and faith in this hour? If situations seem difficult, if problems seem hard, remember that you were called to the kingdom for such an hour as this. This is your time upon this earth. Give it everything you have and give it all to God with the prayer, not my will, but your will be done. It is my will that yours be done, and all things will become as new for you. And then write to us, will you, at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute. The mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. We want to hear from you. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer. All this literature, yours free, no cost, charge, or obligation. When you write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that address. Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.